Much thanks to Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of the DTFH. It's time for you to transform that brain juice in your synaptic clefts into a beautiful website. And Squarespace has everything you need to do that. You can promote your business. You can announce an upcoming event. You can blog or publish your content, showcase your work, sell products and services of all kinds. I've said it before, but it must be mentioned that I have a friend who sells her smelly socks online. Think about that. There's a market for stinky socks. If there's a market for stinky socks, then surely there's a market for your time machine replicas, your coin collection, your beautiful bean bags shaped like human organs or whatever it is that you want to transform into money out there into the world. All you got to do is head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code DUNCAN to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Squarespace allows you to create a beautiful website because they have amazing templates created by world-class designers, powerful e-commerce functionality, which lets you sell anything online, the ability to customize look and feel, settings, products, and more with just a few clicks, and everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. Most importantly, Squarespace is the website I use for DuncanTrussell.com. Every time I upload an episode of this podcast, I go to Squarespace and I put it up on my website, which is a Squarespace website. So if you want an example of what a Squarespace website looks like, check out DuncanTrussell.com. Also, why do you have to have a website for some reason, some business, some announcement? You can have a website just to reek havoc and chaos on the world did you know that right now the domain name skull snorter.com is available can you believe that that sweet precious trembling domain name that powerful moat of energy that thing that is a death metal band that could be anything you could use that to terrify your grandmother you could use that to terrify your little brother or even better You can use it as a website about your dog that you're going to adopt from a rescue shelter and name Skull Snorter. How about that? Go rescue a dog from a nearby kill shelter, name it Skull Snorter, and then get the domain name SkullSnorter.com and put a picture of your dog on that website, and I will tweet about it. Squarespace.com. Check them out. They are a wonderful way for you to make a website without getting hoodwinked by a pseudo web designer who's been snorting a combination of Adderall and Advil and who is more than likely going to have some kind of horrible violent seizure in your house and use a chainsaw to slash your body into thin slivers of flesh that he's going to dry in his basement and eat over the course of the next few years. Squarespace Com. Remember, use offer code DUNCAN and you will get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. SkullSnorter.com is currently available, but it won't be for long. Friends, are you interested in diving deeper into the DTFH? Well, there is a way for you to do that. All you have to do is go to Patreon.com forward slash DTFH. If you do this, you will have early access to commercial-free episodes. Also, I upload at least one hour-long, rambling, embarrassing thing on there a month. And there's lots of other extra stuff that makes its way over there. So if you want to be my patron, if you want to own me, if you want to have the financial fish hook of your power firmly embedded into my digital spine, then all you got to do is head over to patreon.com forward slash DTFH and sign up. I hope you'll do it. Also, we have a shop located at duncantrussell.com with t-shirts, posters, and stickers. Okay, without further ado, let's dive in to this episode. Today's guest is an Emmy-nominated and world-renowned TV personality, storyteller, filmmaker, and keynote speaker and futurist. You've probably seen some of his YouTube videos, Shots of Awe, and you can see him in person. 
coming up March 29th in Los Angeles at Barnum Hall, April 3rd in Miami, and April 6th in New York City. So if you like this conversation, then I highly recommend going to see Jason live. All those links will be located at duncantrussell.com. Now, everyone, please open your mind. Open your hearts, expand your fontanelles, and allow the great sacred flower of your crown chakra to intertwine with the net of Indra that connects all of us to the beautiful mind of today's wonderful guest, Jason Silva. Jason, welcome to the DTFH, man. Thanks for coming over to my house. This is badass that you're sitting across yeah. from me right now. It's so cool. It's great to be here in person, dude. Like I was telling you earlier, it's just it's not the same having these conversations remotely. No, it you just, isn't. You just can't feel the other person's presence, and so the, the feedback loops of conversation just aren't the same. Do you think that you can, like when, when you're recording audio, like, okay, let me start in... I'll start at a place and then Great. you can help me answer the... Okay, so the Hare Krishnas say that you have to be very careful when you're going out to eat because a person's energy gets into the food they're making. So when you're eating, you're not just getting like food, you're getting like however the person's the feeling. The chef's energy. Yeah, you're getting the chef's energy in the That's same way like you see a painting. Like yeah. you go and see a great painting and yeah. it's trippy because there it feels like it's a battery that stored this creative energy yeah. inside of it. Yeah. Do you think that could happen with audio just like this where like more than what we think the sound more than the or within the sound wave some other form of energy is getting recorded that we haven't figured out a way to quantify it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, look, I think that uh when it comes to encoding energy in food uh, I, I'm not. I, I like to think that if a chef is putting a lot of love into the presentation, then the 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 context of that presentation, the set and setting, so to speak, of that presentation can be appreciated when it's right. served to you. Right. But if he's having a bad day, I don't want to think that his anxiety is getting encoded in my food. I'd rather yeah. I'd rather dismiss that because that's just something else to worry about. I mean, dude. but do you? Um, it's but there is like you know this is like it, it's so woo wooey yeah, that it's it beyond woo, but it's deep woo. But there world. is a feeling sometimes you walk into someone's house yeah. who's sick. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like who's depressed, sure. who's sure. been doing weird shit. There's a vibe. There's and, a vibe. I mean, I think with art, it definitely makes sense. Uh, I've been listening a lot to uh, Jordan Peterson's take on art. What is that? What's his take? So, you know Jordan Peterson. Of course, right? yeah. I had, yeah. I had him on the show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So one of, one of his favorite clips, one of my favorite clips of his on the internet is why you need art in your life. And he has this example where he's talking about like people in a modern art museum, you know, or or just an art museum staring at like paintings that are worth like a billion dollars. And the guy's like, yeah, why are these people like staring at this painting? Why is this painting worth a billion dollars? You know, and then he says, like, why are people are like dumbstruck by awe when they're staring at these images? And, yeah. And then what he says is, well, what. The reason they're staring at these paintings is because the transcendent shines through the masses uh -huh. in partially articulated form. So to that to that end, the painting is an encoding of the artist's attempt or an experience of the artist's encounter with the sublime. Is it a window? It, it's a window. It's a portal. It's an encoding. And I suppose that, you know, to an extent, we know that the transcendent can be encoded in music. For you sure. You know, like it, it, music is a, is a painting that unfolds in time, you yeah. could say. And when you listen, I mean, even the first records, right? The LPs, like those are grooves that are etched into the LP yeah. that when a needle hits <laughs> them, like the, like rubbing the magic wand, you know, the, or the, 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 the genie lamp, the thing like is reborn, yeah. the transcendent emerges. Yeah. And to an extent, you know, a, an image, a painting is a still frame of that very, very same experience. It's an encounter with the ineffable in our, in our attempt to capture that. And some people say, well, a painting or a song is, is a 
poor representation of the transcendent. And, right. I, and I would argue the otherwise. I would argue, I, I would argue the other extreme, which is actually, no, I think it's exactly a glimpse of the transcendent. It's not a poor representation. It is the transcendent. Can you what, define, what do you think the transcendent is? <sighs> the bridge between the finite and the infinite, right? Um, I think it was one of these guys, I don't know if it was Dostoevsky or no, Tolstoy, who said that man cannot live if he doesn't find a way to bridge the finite with the infinite, Mm. right? Because we are mortal and we are bounded and we are finite, and that causes all kinds of existential distress. I mean, that's like an impossible pill to swallow. How do you escape from the infinite? Like, how can you not be instantly bound with the infinite? What is, and I know, there is a, there clearly is. In humans, yeah, a kind yeah. of tourniquet wrapped around whatever it is that is connecting us to the truth of our never-ending permeation throughout well, infinity. But what is that block? Well, I think the block is that self-awareness as we know it uh, rises from a meat machine, right? Yeah. The brain, which is the most powerful computer in the universe so far, but the brain is housed in a heart-pumping, breath-gasping, decaying body. So, you know, the pattern of information that makes up consciousness, the, this thing that we are that can think about its own thinking, this miracle of self-reference that is the human being, is still bound in entropic processes. Mm. We age and we die. And, you know, Ernest Becker in his book, The Denial of Death, uh, which was the distillation of the human condition, says that the source of our neurosis, our existential distress, our anxiety, and our depression is rooted in the fact that we're uniquely aware that we are mortal beings. Mm. Other animals are free to live in the present. You know, They only react to like an actual predator hunting them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the predator is not around, they live in the Garden of Eden. Right. We, even when everything is fine and we feel safe, we yeah. might lose sleep over the fact that one day in the future we might not exist anymore. For and that sure. haunts the human animal like nothing else. And so what Tolstoy said, said is that we actually cannot live if we don't find a technique or a means to bridge our abject finitude with the infinite and Mm -hmm. with the transcendent which is the same thing that jordan peterson was saying in why you need art in your life he was talking about like a beautiful gothic cathedral or the the beautiful medieval buildings in europe and how magnificent they were and it's like you can't stand how beautiful they are it's because they provide a bridge to the transcendent and without the transcendent all we're left with is fleeting trivial pleasures and those things don't give us the strength to prevail which is very true do you feel like you're a window to the transcendent i think that there are certain situations and contexts when i drop into a state of consciousness where the sense of self falls away and i feel tapped into something larger than myself what is that thing what is that experience no that you're tapped into what's the thing (laughs) are you still jason there I, 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 look, I, I, I'm a skeptic even of my own experiences of the You don't want to say you're a channeler. Divine. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a little bit like, um, to sort of paraphrase Khalil Gibran when he's talking about children, he says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life longing for itself. They come through you but not from you, and though they are with Wait, you, they hold on, hold on, Hold on, Jason. I apologize. Yeah. When you spray out. Yeah. Something that beautiful. Yeah, say it slowly. You got to do it slow okay. around old D trust because yes. that takes a little while for the for my brain sure. gears to grind sure, that sure, one up. Sure, Let's sure, do sure. it so, slow. So, so my mother is an English teacher. And yes. She taught high school English literature. She used to have beautiful quotes on the wall in her classroom. And one of the quotes by Khalil Gibran was about your children you yeah. know, when we have kids. Yeah. And he said, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life longing for itself. Uh, They come through you, but uh, not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. Which is magnificent, right? Fuck. Now, I think that, of course, that applies to the idea of your children and the the, the sort of the magical force of the universe, the self-organizing properties of the universe flowing through you to your, from your sperm to the egg that makes this thing called life. But I think also that the word children can be a stand in for anything that flows through you. I think that my videos are my children. I think your podcast are, is, is, is a child of yours. I think anything that we make is, is, is a for, is a form of, you know, is our children. Do you have children? I mean, I have a lot of videos that I think of as my children. <laughs> but do you but ever no. think about making, you know, bringing one of these beautiful things into the universe? Potentially, but I'm not ready yet. I'm what, what? still sorting myself out. But, oh, yeah? <laughs> but, but to go back to your question about whether when I tap into something, whether I feel like I'm a channel, whether we connect with the divine, you know, certainly the art is a portal to the transcendent, but are we portals to the transcendent? You know? mm-hmm. um, 
there's a guy called Tim Duty that was writing about psychedelic experiences. And he was saying that during these moments that you're talking about, when we feel like we are channels to the divine, or yeah. we, we ourselves are the bridge, right? Yeah. Or we ourselves are the instrument and something is strumming us. Yes. He says during these moments, um, we recontextualize the self, the notion of self, and we see it instead as a marvelous conduit in a timeless whole mm. from which molecules and meanings flow from neurons to nebula and back again. Wow. That's a nice feeling, right? From yeah. the iris to the universe. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that we're capable of actually engineering scaffoldings of mind, technological extensions of our minds that extend this metaphor of us being conduits between yes. the finite and the infinite. So a guy called Ross Anderson and I'm getting very excited because it's one of my favorite essays ever. Cool. A guy called Ross Anderson wrote a piece about the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. And it was about the Hubble Space Telescope and the new James Webb Telescope, which is going to be like 10 times more powerful. And he was saying that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, okay, so literally it's like an extension of the human eye that hangs in orbit. But it's pretty much the human mind turned inside out because it's a part of us. We okay, made it. Yeah, 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 sure. And he says that the Hubble allows us to mainline space and time through the optic nerve. <laughs> oh, shit. That's crazy. But that's what it is. It's not even a fucking metaphor, <laughs> right? Weird. That the Hubble Space Telescope allows us to mainline space wow. and time through the optic wow. nerve, right? That we're capable of creating something <laughs> that allows us to take in space and time on a scale just shy of the infinite. It's something like that is hyper- beyond our nervous system's capacity to perceive the world. Got and nonetheless, it. we create it. And then he goes on and he says through the sheer... Wait, aesthetic- hold on. He's saying like we're shooting up space space yeah. through the Hubble telescope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so rad. Yeah. It's like people smoke DMT to see the infinite, but it's kind of cool that we have this fucking hovering lens that is allows us to shoot up space and time through why the optic why nerve. Why do we have to use the heroin? Can we say it's like a straw that we're sucking up the milkshake uh, like, yeah. of the cosmos yeah. through? Yeah. Yeah. You remember when those images... Space cock. Space cock. It's, you could say it's space coming in your eyes. There you go. Why does this guy... This Whoever wrote this essay... Ross does, Anderson. He likes heroin. That's what we know heroin. about Ross Anderson. <laughs> Ross well, Anderson blasts heroin from time well, to time. Yeah. I mean, look. I mean, we can use the experiences like, like getting drunk on awe... Or, or 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 crack for the thinking mind. That's another one that I've heard about beautiful content. Dude, but, come here. I want to fucking shoot up space with you, time. man. I know. I, I would, know. you know, I'd share a needle with you, Jason, to shoot up space. I swear to God I would. Just like, uh, 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 well, yeah. Here's another word for when we're cracked open by divine experiences. Um, it was a New York Times article about this, and they, they referred to it as opiated adjacency. Again, uh, opiated adjacency. So it's like, <laughs> like you're ripped apart. Yes. Right? And then the light can get in, right? Yes. And the cracks is where the light gets in, as yes. Leonard Cohen said. That's right. But um, but in this same piece, so he was saying that, that remember when the deep field photographs of Fuck, the universe yeah. were published? Totally. So they took a picture of like a dark piece of the sky. Yeah. And then they did all this like post processing yeah. on it. And then the dark piece of the sky revealed a cosmos within a cosmos, yeah. right? Yeah. And he said that gazing upon the deep field photograph was nothing less than an ontological awakening, a forceful reckoning with what is. Wow. Okay. Now, that sounds to me like a psychedelic experience. For sure. That sounds to me like psilocybin and seeing the light. Yes. Um, or, what you know, what's that guy, American psychologist William James, right, when he talked about the mystical experience and all the, yes. all the boxes it has to tick. But here you are just... This is a scientific instrument hovering in orbit, taking a picture of the cosmos, and yeah. looking upon those images and contemplating those images is an ontological awakening, right? Yeah, and kind of like what you're doing, I guess, is like you're kind of like a Hubble telescope for inner space, or you seem to be some kind of <laughs> Hubble telescope for a field that you yeah. seem to be particularly attuned to, mm. which seems to be something to do with the sense of. Mm. awe or wonder or there's yeah. a specific feeling yeah, yeah, yeah. that we get when yeah. we come into contact with certain types of technology certain types of art mm-hmm. and this feeling is disastrous for some people and in fact that was the first question i had for you actually so i'm sorry to start now with the first question but i think we're in a perfect place for me to ask it uh so okay so i did this show with um 
with Rogan, and we ended up going to that GF 2045 summit that Dmitry Itchkov was throwing in New York with, like, okay. he's that billionaire who wants to, like, okay. live forever. And so oh, he does. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 he, yeah. He was mixing up all these, mm-hmm. like, technologists, and, like, there were a lot of really a couple smart... years ago, right? Yes. I was there. Oh, okay. I figured. Yeah, I, fi- I think. And Rogan uh, came. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, this is what I wanted to talk to you about, because I thought it was really beautiful, and it was really interesting, because he didn't just have technologists. He had buddhists Mm -hmm. he had coptics Mm -hmm. he had all these like religious people Mm -hmm. there too but i wondered if you could address the feeling of malevolence that some people get when they come into contact with the incoming technology that's about to radically transform everything the part of ourselves that isn't the way you are and i think the way i am most of the time is like Yes, mm-hmm. amazing, sure. beautiful. But yeah. some people they meet this energy and they say, "No, yeah, this is fucked, man. <laughs> this is Satan. This is malevolence, yeah. uh, technologizing itself, yeah. uh, pushing itself into time. We're looking at the hand of the Antichrist. It's not Rosemary's baby. It's Rosemary's fucking computer. How do you address? What do you say to those people to comfort them?" Uh, I think that rapid change uh, and and too much information can be overwhelming. Um, and you know, for for what's happening with disruptive technology, it, it is kind of like instead of mainlining space and time through the optic nerve, it, it's kind of like mainlining infinite computational capacity through very finite brains. So yeah. the, the implications of these technologies are that we're going to essentially render ourselves gods in a very real yeah. way you know it's 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 you know you go to these places like singularity university and sure these, these guys travel around the world teaching company ceos about exponential technologies but you know the whole notion of exponential technologies can be can be sort of explored or explained in a simple example the supercomputer that 40 years ago cost 60 million bucks and was half a building in size has now shrunk to a device in your pocket right the device in your pocket's a million times cheaper a million times smaller yeah. and a thousand times more powerful yeah so that's exponential change yeah because and, and the brain is wired to think about change in a linear fashion so what happens is every time that you have a, a experiential or visceral encounter with exponential speed and exponential change it's going to create cognitive dissonance because your intuition about the world and your intuition about change remains linear so right we're future huh. blind and so it's, yeah. it's it's a constant sense of uh, of cognitive dissonance no matter what people tell us yeah technologies change fast your intuition continues to be linear so even though we've seen that change thus far and then you make extrapolations from that those very same rates of change and you pull them out 25 years from now and you say in 25 years the supercomputer will be the size of a blood cell it'll be in your bodies and brains it'll reverse engineers from inside out and yeah. people are like no way not in 25 years maybe yeah. in the next lifetime yeah no know? way that's not gonna happen right. no way yeah. no so, i don't so, want to so people no, resist they'll go, they'll go don't no i i some people will go I, i'm not talking about that yeah. They'll say, I'm not talking about it. We, yeah. we can't talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is really interesting to me because it's like um, uh, the example I've used is if we were to get a signal yeah. from deep space Oof. saying we're coming mm-hmm. in 25 years, then the whole planet would prepare for this arrival. Like sure. there would be a, a, a massive shift. Yeah. We would, the, yeah. all the militaries of the world would probably start meeting together sure, sure. to talk about how to yeah. deal with it. If it's, if it's yeah. potentially aggressive. Yeah. Then, Contact is one of my favorite movies ever for that reason. Yeah. For the way it portrays the way society starts to deal with this. Yeah. And, and, but yeah, people like, people like you. And when I say people like you, futurists, yeah. like, it's safe to call you a futurist. Sure, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. People like you who are, are like transmitting a, a, yeah. an analysis of what's yeah. coming sure. in, a, in a really profoundly yeah. articulate way mm-hmm. are essentially our signal coming from deep space saying, hey, this is fucking coming. Right. And we hear you and yeah. people love your YouTube. How many yeah. how many millions of people have seen this shit now? A lot. Like I think we've had like 100 million. 100 million, yeah, million people have seen this yeah. stuff. And yeah. yet yeah. people are still like, well, that's just cool. Yeah. It's cool. That's cool. Yeah. But you're like, no, listen. Yeah. 
we're about to go through yeah. one of the most radical yeah. things yeah. that has ever happened. I mean, yeah. it's com- comparable, I guess, yeah. to like meteor impact, sure. extinction yeah. events, yeah. some kind of uh, some something on that level. And yet, we still, when we hear you, yeah. we're like, oh, okay, okay, yeah. but I got to go to work. Yeah, well, of course. And I think it's we we carry around these mental models of reality. It's a simple energy saving aspect of our brain. Our brain is thrust into a new environment. It makes assessments and makes inferences about that environment because and Jordan Peterson talks about this too. It's like the world is infinitely complex. There's no possible way we can fully understand the world in all of its complexity. And so we're reduced or we're left with the possibility of making only simple inferences about the world. Our brain does this all the time. Right. Our brain takes shortcuts. It sure. connects the dots and it makes predictions constantly about the world. Right. And as long as those predictions allow us to orient ourselves and function in the world in a way where we can survive and we sort of feel kind of safe, that's a that's a that's functionally useful. Um, we do the same thing with our character. Sure. Like we don't fully know ourselves. Ernest Becker says character is a vital lie. Our house of cards <laughs> that constructs the self is built on stilts, but it's necessary, right? That's why some people actually are not meant to take psychedelics. You know, the involuntary killing of the ego can cause trauma. You know, you know, people say psychedelics can cure PTSD. Yeah, because that's the voluntary killing of the ego. That's somebody yeah. training and preparing and working with a shaman and sort of knowing what they're getting into right. versus an involuntary killing of the ego like what you get when somebody betrays you for example you know because the same uh, way you make inferences about the world you make inferences about the people you trust yeah. right and you assume that these assumptions that you make are true but then when those assumptions are called into question right somebody betrays you something happens that you really didn't expect then it calls all your assumptions about the world into question and so you're hurled all of a sudden into a place of anxiety and or depression which is really just chaos you're lost at sea well you're, you're lost now i think it's you know like you know, okay i was talking to oh, krishna das yeah about trusting yeah. people and how like you know inevitably you'll encounter a person who is most certainly yeah. just a liar i mean we've yeah. all come into contact I and mean, there's a pathological liars out there yeah. you know they just sure. they can't the the program they're running yeah is a program that's just innately fundamentally uh-huh deceptive uh-huh. like on the deepest level for whatever reason they can't say what's actually happening mm-hmm. probably because they're afraid or whatever mm-hmm. so i was asking him about this like how do we deal with these kinds of people and he was saying oh well you, I mean, you can trust them to be what they're like and so in other words you can trust them to be liars so you know so the trust is not so so it's like mm. it's like our expectation is that you will tell me the truth. Right. Now that's different. Then ha- Fuck our expectation. Yeah. Yeah. The truth is that you're a liar. Not sure. you, but sure. I'm saying, you sure. know what I mean? You get sure. around people and they're just fucking, lo- that's just the way they are. Sure. So you accept people on their own terms and maybe you lower your expectations as a way of protecting yourself from experiencing the disorienting anxiety yeah. of realizing your assumptions about a person are wrong. Or you enjoy being lied to because you realize oh cool this is a liar i want to get fucking hypnotized by your beautiful lies there's this um at burning man do you Mm -hmm. ever go to burning man you know i've been debating going there for years the reason i haven't gone you'll laugh at but it's 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 a result of my neurosis about what well, the, the one, I'm really, really sensitive to sleep and like not sleeping, and uh, my concern is that I won't find a place of quiet. Oh no, there's quiet places to camp out there. There's Where like, I won't hear the throbbing bass deep, beat. You can go way out. There's way. Oh my god, dude. There's places. It's the fucking. You can go to. There are quiet camps because well, there's. That's what, there's, I, need, that's what I need to solve. They bring for. kids there and stuff, okay. you know. So like, you can't keep them by right. by that. Where our camp is is next to the. Right. Bo- right. Bo- right. Bo- that's bo- like my worst nightmare. But, oh, I know. But see, that's the kind of thing that. That helps you grow because you start like realizing that like for at least for a week that part of you that that is resisting yeah that or needs that metered sleep of course you say goodbye to it and then you enter into this liminal sort of oh i love liminality in, liminality beautiful. is everything bro it's, it's like when you're captivated by a movie or a play man best. It's you know beautiful. i remember i remember seeing this immersive theater experience 
uh, it's kind of built on like Alice in Wonderland in New York, and there was this whole speech about liminality at the beginning of this immersive play. Yeah, and then I ended up like googling the word because I was obsessed with that sensation, like the sensation of being captivated and losing yourself in a mediated environment. Yeah. Liminality. Liminality is a threshold state. Yeah, it's a threshold state between waking and dreaming, the between best. dreams and reality. It's an imaginal realm. Yeah, it's where creativity is born. It's where humans exist and between yeah, non-existence and non-existence. It's a deep presence yeah. is associated with it you're free of time you're in deep flow yeah you're free of the inner chatter as well yeah and what also happens in these liminal states is that you you're, you're you have a meta awareness that you're in it so at least for me when i'm in a liminal state i'm usually thinking to myself i'm having so much fucking fun this is so fucking awesome yeah. i wish i felt like this more often yeah. note to self what were the triggers for yeah. this this is where yeah. my friendship with steven kotler and jamie wheel comes from yeah. because i'm like tell me how to fucking go liminal and get into flow on a Day to day basis, you know. Basis. Yeah. David well, Lenson calls it stewardship of internal life. Mm. The desire to control the contents and the mood of one's consciousness. Man. Yeah. Well, I, I, to, I want to dive back yeah. into that because that's really interesting is yeah. how to do that. But yeah. Uh, so, but one of the things that Burning Man, uh, to get back to the concept of trust, is yeah. there's one, one of the camps there is called uh, the Bureau of Misinformation. And this is one of my favorite camps there because everyone there they have like a bar and they just lie oh, cool. so you go there and all they do is is they just don't tell the truth yeah and they're really good at it yeah. and when you talk to them all of them will say things like i honestly i'm the worst liar ever i just i like they're doing that stuff mm -hmm. but i'm just at this camp for a different reason mm -hmm. and it's beautiful because what it does is it forces you to surrender to a paradigm everything and and what that and and then you begin to realize and then so now we're starting to play around with the concept of like uh, truth through symbols which okay. is that um and I, I interviewed this like beautiful musician will oldham and he was talking about how when they were on tour you know there's a tendency people have right now where somebody yeah. will say some, whatever it is someone will ask yeah. them question like yeah. how deep this is on rogan's podcast you can do that we like how deep is the is the sand in egypt right and jamie pull that up so jamie will like google how deep is the sand in egypt and we have an answer right and that's great and then now we both have a feeling of having a question answer i'm like oh now we know how deep the sand is mm -hmm. well this guy oldham was saying when they're on tour they had like a banana called the google banana okay and whenever anyone had a question like that they'd be like oh google it and they pick up the banana and make up a fucking lie of oh, dance. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know what? Well, you know what's brilliant about that? It, it kind of alludes a little bit to what Diane Ackerman refers to as deep play. Yeah. Um, or or kind of like, you know, have you heard of LARPing? Like yes. those people that get into like those deep gaming stuff and they all come in costumes and meet in the forest and yeah. take on alter egos. Yeah. And, and by the way, that's like really fun because that's what children do. You know, I have a friend of mine. I grew up in South America. I have a good friend of mine from Venezuela. And we'll sometimes call each other on the phone and we'll speak in alter ego for the first 15 minutes of conversation yeah. before we actually talk about that's whatever it. we call them about. I'll call him like in character. Yeah. And I'll have a whole conversation where I'm making shit up completely in yeah. Spanish. Like in like a ridiculous backstory. Like, yeah. and it's it's awesome, you know. Sometimes we do it with the stupid Snapchat masks, you know, yeah. where you change their face filter. Yes. So it's even easier yeah. to go into that, like, yeah. lying, creating, pure – it's pure creation. It's yeah. creating and perceiving your world at the same time. The problem with doing that in baseline reality is that we need consensus to create order in the world uh -huh. and to collaborate and to work together. But eventually, I think, if the AIs take over, if we no longer need normal jobs because everything can be done by machines. So, you know, Yuval Harari, who wrote Sapiens and Homo Deus, yeah. wrote an article in The Guardian called How to Find Meaning in a World Where Nobody is Needs to Work Anymore. Right. The Rise of the Useless Class when AIs will take care of everything. He says we'll find meaning in VR. Yeah. He says we'll find meaning in VR. Everybody will move into a universe of their own construction. Yeah. Maybe multiple people will tune into like shared universes, but these universes won't be bounded by rationality or by any kind of the rules or grids of this matrix. So it'll be deep play. Love. You'll be a man. You'll be a woman. You'll be a, be a dragon. You'll make it up as you go along. But it's love. It's like that, you know, and when people, and I like, and I know he doesn't mean it in this way, but when yeah. people say useless yeah. 
as in the sense that work makes us useful. Right, right, right. It right, right. seems to be an indication of a, 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 a fucked what, up priorities, of yeah, course. Yeah, because it's because it's like economically useless. And 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 also when you were talking about LARPing, you know, yeah. of course, really, if we look at what's happened to us here, yeah, is we've been shot out of pussies into one of the longest LARPing events in the universe, which is called human existence itself. Well, of course. And we're playing these characters, well, of course. And, right? And they're all virtual realities. So yeah. LARPing is a, is a sort of boutique version, yeah. but like you could argue that every religion, and Yaval Harari says this, every religion is a virtual reality. Yeah. You follow the rules, you score points, and then you win when you get to the afterlife. And you're Jason Silva-ing right now. For sure. And I'm Duncan Trussling right now, sure. but if we really think about it, this yeah. isn't who we are. It's a monkey suit. It's you put a, it on. Yeah, and yeah. and we have these ways of expressing ourselves because yeah. underneath it, you know what's underneath I th- your what's coming out of you is love. I hope and so. And the way that you're doing it is like by by you're, you're getting these beautiful globs of love mm. and then you're painting them in these with these sweet quotes and these basically like you're blowing these love bubbles yeah. that are surrounded by Khalil Gibran quotes and inside it though it's just yeah. love. It's like oh, I, I think it's love. I mean I think I think wonder and awe uh are, are the experiences of the sublime in general is aesthetically relevant experience like to be moved to tears like Albert Camus said life should be lived to the point of tears yes the reason I seek out these experiences aside from the fact that they're completely transporting and they feel really good to hold in mind to contemplate them as you're having them but also they offer a refuge and a relief from despair from mm. nihilism from nothingness you know mm. I mean you say you know Ernest Becker when he says that character is a vital lie yeah that that this version of LARPing, that even the consensus baseline version of LARPing, which is to say, I'm an American citizen and I'm Jason Silva and I'm an artist, that to a certain extent we need to we need to summon coherence in our identity because without mm-hmm. it, then we're also lost at sea. Like we need certain constraints. Jordan Peterson talks about this. You need the constraints of avoiding pain, right? That's yeah. important. You don't want pain. And you need to protect yourself from pain in the present, but also in the future. And you need to take other people into account, not just now, but in the future. All these things and these constraints are necessary to form a coherent narrative and a sense of personhood that allows you to move towards a noble goal. Because by the way, without that, it is chaotic. I mean, when you read about it people is? who suffer from like depersonalization, for example, yeah. or derealization, yeah. where they think that their own, they, they feel like everything is fake, or like their own identity is not real anymore. That sounds like a pathology to me. Those people suffer a lot. Really, they start going. They maybe they take too many psychedelics, and it triggers some weird psychosis where they have derealization experiences that persist past the psychedelic, where they walk around the world and they feel like they're not a part of it anymore. Have you ever heard the story of Hanuman and Ram? You know, the monkey god? You'll like this. So this is uh, to to go into the concept of depersonalization as a pathology Mm -hmm. versus, which it certainly can be, Mm -hmm. or depersonalization as a form of realization and awakening. And I think they're both are very possible. Sure. So the... Health. Interpretation is the only thing that makes the difference. There. Well, yeah, that, that well, what the is framing. It? You'll know this quote, and I always fuck it up. What is it? What is it? The mystic swims in the same. Yeah, the, wa- the mystic and the madman are in the same waters, but the mystic is swimming, the madman is drowning. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a Hanuman. You know, is the representation of the great servant. You know, yeah. which is the idea of like we're here to serve each other. Sure. We're here. That's our sure. usefulness is yeah. to serve each other. Yeah. And I, I would add to that to serve each other by articulating love through action and and movement and everything yeah. we do if we can so Hanuman is with Ram who is like the you know, God essentially yeah. and ha- and Ram is like kind of blown away by this monkey being because it's so filled with love and okay. it served him so Ram says who are you monkey and the monkey <laughs> says to him <clears throat> when I forget who I am yeah I serve you. Yeah. When mm. I remember who I am, I become you. <laughs> that cool? well, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow. Wow. So, and this is the, you know, this is the, this is what, what, when you were when, earlier, when you're talking about those moments where it's almost as though you're being strummed by some invisible finger and then these beautiful sounds are coming out of you that make people feel like there is some reason to be here. Right. Who, in those moments, you're not Jason Silving. You're something else. And that thing is yeah. w- one word for it that they use as a term of convenience, really, is Ram, Ram, Om, Om, Mom, Mom. You know?
know, it's yeah, that sound of you. like, ah, ah, yeah, you know, yeah. even your thing, shots of ah, because it's that sound. Ah, sure. that's what we become, you know, for sure. a second. And then. But, but here's the thing. The, becoming that. One thing is undergoing that experience and just going, like, just having it, right? Yeah. Another thing is is thinking about it afterwards and and, and deciding in in contemplating. Wow, I wasn't there. Yeah. If, whether that's exhilarating or, or harrowing, you know, Abraham Maslow he talked about we we get a thrill from the godlike possibilities yeah. we see in ourselves, yet we simultaneously shiver. At these very same possibilities, uh, it feels good to shiver, though. You know, I mean, look if I if I was to talk about uh, the experiences that I've had in, in theogenic experiences, because again, framing matters, right? Psychedelics were first called psychotomimetics, right? Yes, which is a psychosis inducing. Then they were called psychedelics, which means mind manifesting. Now they're called entheogenics, which means God facilitating. Yes, and the whole point is in set and setting heuristics. Yes, the what you mentally bring to the psychedelic experience as well as the place that you're in will bleed into the psychedelic dream. Yes. Um, but also the words you use to describe the experience beforehand are not just descriptive, they're generative. They, yeah. they actually become the experience. Yes. And so I've had entheogenic experience with, experiences with, with cannabis where I've experienced uh, the, the, the acronym in the flow states, they call it STIR. So selflessness, timelessness, mm. effortlessness, and richness. Yeah. So your sense of self, i.e. the monkey mind, disappears. Your connection to the tyranny of time passing is gone. You're yeah. unstuck in time. Um, there's a sense of effortlessness, effortless fluidity in whatever activity you're doing. Yeah. Increased pattern recognition, increased lateral thinking, increased associational thinking. Um, but then there's also this richness of information that comes in. It's the reason I'm able to do my, my videos without a script, you know, and I get... Just I, I get I lose myself in these soliloquies. Yes. Now, I, ha- I happen to be a, a guy that loves words, but for some people it's snowboarding down the mountain. For some people sure. it's surfing. Whatever your thing is, but I definitely know what it's like to experience that no mind of like heightened lucidity with paradoxically a loss of self. But sometimes you have to toe that line because you're basically flirting. You're towing the line between chaos and order. Right, and Jordan Peterson talks about this too. So chaos and order is like, okay, there's the wave, and you're surfing the wave. But if the wave is too big and you wipe out, then you're overwhelmed by chaos. You could even drown. And if the wave is too small and you get bored, well, then you're bored. You're stuck. You know, that's that's its own version of oppression as well. So it's like, what's beyond boredom and anxiety? Chick Send Me High's book, Beyond Boredom and Anxiety, is flow. Towing the line between chaos and order is flow. This no mind flow state, again, is where the magic is at. But don't forget that you're flirting with two forces, both of which can be fucked up. Do you ever worry that you're going crazy? Uh, I've had panic attacks in my life. You have? How yeah. often? When was the last panic attack you had? Like three years ago. I, I briefly fainted uh, after having some kind of indigestion at a restaurant. Huh. Um like it was very brief, like a few seconds. But of course, being a hypochondriac, when I came to and I realized that I had just fainted, I went straight to, "Oh, I'm, I'm dying." Yes. And I went to the emergency room. Yes, yeah, sure. Thing. And Classic. That was a harrowing experience because, of course, they all look at you like you're crazy, which makes it worse. Because you're like, "I want an EKG. I just fainted. I want a CAT scan. Like, look into my body." Yeah, dude. And yeah. It was, it was a horrible experience. I had micro PTSD for months afterwards with like micro anxiety attacks and like shortness of breath type shit. But then I did a. MDMA therapy session that, really that helped. helped with that. Yeah, yeah. What do you when you when you when you're dying? Yeah. What's your plan? Well, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm banking everything I can on the singularity happening before I. Oh grow really? Old. Oh yeah. But let's say that it doesn't. Yeah. And you find yourself dying. What's your plan? I, I don't have a plan. My plan is deny, 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 deny as long as I can deny, 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 deny. Really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't want to die. Any philosophy that accepts death must itself be considered dead. Its questions meaningless. Its consolations worn out. Who the fuck said that? Alan, Get him out of here. Alan Harrington in The Immortalist. <laughs> he needs to do ketamine. <laughs> He's done a lot of the psychedelics. He says that we lose our sense of self in temples of fragmentation in a form of electronic Buddhism. But we still come back to ourselves and we still got to work on the human project, which mm. is the we have to be the enemies of entropy. 
He said, we must never forget. Wow. We must never forget we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everyone. Dear God, he's a fucking bummer, dude. He's like at war with the universe, revolutionary stooges, work. This guy's a... It's interesting. Si- so you've ennobled death already. You've, I'm just saying yeah, this yeah. guy is assigning us to... If he's like a fucking existential general making yeah. us all do some weird marching order according to his terror of being annihilated by the universe i you know i love lately i've been thinking a lot about it <laughs> like, you know, but the thing is dude I, I i can i can sort of join in the ecstasy of making art of getting out of our own way of being channels for the divine yes but i also think that we have this unique capacity to Imagineer tools that allow us to overcome our own limitations and our own boundaries. Yes. Why should sentience itself not use every resource at its disposal to stabilize identity beyond the forces of entropy? Okay, okay, okay. I, got I, you. I, I mean, there's, there just can be no possible interpretation under which you could get me to think that the death of the people that i love is beautiful i want you to live forever don't get me wrong i want you to live forever thank you but i think that doesn't have anything to do with the body now you know about um i wish i believed you. we'll never be able to prove it in this podcast but you know um uh so dmt we smoke dmt the body processes it's 10 minutes it's gone right and so we use a what's it called an mao inhibitor right so that our uh we we won't so the dmt will last a little bit longer that's uh, ayahuasca right so it's essentially the thing that allows the dmt to get processed out of the brain we put a little stopper in the Mm -hmm. drain Mm -hmm. so we can experience it longer now Mm -hmm. what i think many futurists want when they want life extension is to do essentially the same thing for the human body which is we want an mao inhibitor for existence itself so we can experience the beautiful epiphanous human experience which is actually the universe getting high as a fucking kite on this really advanced neurology and so we want that high to last much longer you're like somebody who knows you're gonna come down man you're gonna come down your the trips the silva trip the beautiful fucking brilliant jason silva pure fresh off the crystal silva that you took at some point as the universe you entered into this like hopefully 600 year maybe longer trip wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if advances in biotechnology at the very least gave us like a multiples of three lifespan extension. So, like, you know, lifespan average used to be 30. Now it's pushing Fuck 80. Yeah. That was before these interventions Fuck kicked yeah. in. I mean, it would be nice if we could go in and do, oh. like, rejuvenation therapy for ourselves mm. and just off the bat just be like, bro, you live 500 years do it. before you even start to, to decay. Let me tell you and something. Then, and then we'll talk. Let's talk in 400 years. We'll have this debate in 400 years. Uh, in I, the meantime, we'll have a front row seat I, to the greatest I, fucking show of all time. I honestly think... In 400 years, there is a possibility that you and I will be doing this kind of podcast, but it maybe won't be us. It'll be in the Mars, or in the moon be, base. Well, no, someone might have like duplicated our personalities and thrown yeah. it in a simulator, and they're like, right. all right, let's see how they fucking feel about death in 400 years. But the, 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 I think that the, the, the essence of it is, and what's, what I think is really beautiful about being a human, and we need it, yeah. is this concept that the, the the consciousness is anchored in biology and sure. and 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 i think that once that starts going away the what was the drill sergeant you were talking about what's his name alan harrington harrington the drill sergeant of existence people like that are like the moment that starts going away what are we going to become fucking blobs what what are we going to do walk in front of cars yeah. get yeah. run over what we yeah. need this we've got to cling desperately to these 60 or 70 years even though the truth of the matter is man it's done. We're dead. Like, you know, um, uh, that vacation phenomena where, like, you've been looking for, like, I, I go to these Ramdas retreats. I'm going to one coming up in May. I'm so excited about it. Right now, I'm already like, oh, fuck, here it's coming, man. In yeah. May, I'm going to be in fucking Maui. I can't wait. The energy is going to be so beautiful. But, dude, you know, suddenly, like, you're on the plane, you're going to the fucking vacation, and then suddenly you're on the plane coming back from the vacation. You're like, wait, the vacation didn't really even happen. That's what death is like, except it's with your life because <laughs> you're just laying in your deathbed and you're like, oh, shit. 
that was nothing. In fact, that didn't even happen. That was just a nothing. Wow. And now I here I am. It's being, such a depressing thought. Ah, uh, for you it is, but that is the that that for you it's depressing. And on one level, it certainly is. Oh, it's beyond depressing. It's beyond the beyond the beyond. We're talking about the great annihilation of self, which is why I'm really interested in Shiva. Because yeah. one of the terms for Shiva is the destroyer of elements. That means yeah. that the fundamental basic yeah. components yeah. of the universe yeah. are going to be yeah. annihilated. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, whatever you want to call it, the See, heat. That, go ahead. Respectfully. Please. I, I, Please my, be my, my intuition continues to be that the prospect of death, not just of our own, but of the people we love, is so trauma traumatic to even contemplate yeah that, that i think it can cause a schism in our psyche mm. and that from it can emerge this pardon me for saying this but a kind of perpetuating delusion that somehow this is how it's supposed to be and it's beautiful mm. when actually it's it's not just that it's not beautiful it's that we've committed no crime and we've afflicted with it we're afflicted with a death sentence it's actually like the most horrifying thing that you can possibly do is to have a sentient being and tell it it's going to die. Do you know what Jack Kerouac said about birth? No. To have a child is to sentence a being to death. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I know. I well, know. You know, Ernest Becker, in his doc there was a documentary made about his work called The Denial of... Uh, the Quest for Immortality, but it was saying to have emerged, uh, from, to have emerged from nothing... To have a name, mm. consciousness of self, deep inner feeling, an excruciating inner yearning for life and self-expression. Yet with all this, yet to die. What else is wrong with the universe to you? But besides entropy? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's two opposing forces, right? So, so entropy is, is breaking everything down. But like Bucky Fuller said that life was sort of gloriously anti-entropic. It was extropic, you know. So where the, where, whereas entropy wants to simplify things, life wants to make things more complicated and sublime. Greater complexity in organization. And then you can have like emergent phenomenon. So when but, you have sufficient complexity, something new can be born. From right. It, and you just have just a novelty engendering engine, you know. And I that's just, better. I, what I mean is like outside of conquering death. If there were other f aspects of the universe that you could get rid of, for example, black holes. Right. If you could el eliminate black holes from the universe, would you do that? I don't know. I mean, they're very interesting computational substrates, right? I yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the transcension hypothesis. No, tell me. So there's a guy called John Smart. You should get him here sometime. He's a brilliant dude. And he came up with a theory uh, to account for Fermi's paradox. So Fermi's paradox is, is, of course, the universe with its vast scales of time and space yes. and all the preconditions for life potentia yeah. potentially present, so many different galaxies, and et cetera. Yeah. Um, then how come we don't see any evidence of advanced alien civilizations? Yeah, where are they? And so he, that, that's Fermi's paradox. And the transcension hypothesis basically says that if you look, if you look at the human story, uh, we're we're sort of in our technological adolescence, and we've been like exploring outwards, like yeah. colonizing other, you know, continents and colonizing, going to the moon and yeah. maybe going to Mars. Like there's this outward expansion that's happening concurrently with the inward expansion, right? Whether it's creating denser and denser computational substrates, more computational capacity, and denser and denser spaces. Okay, yeah. Until eventually we reach femtoscale computing yeah which is already like the computational density of a black hole right and that when you have femtoscale computing and you have virtual universes in those femtoscale like you mentioned you know the running a simulation of the universe in a femtoscale density com com computer and then you have digital minds artificial intelligent algorithms that are living in this world right like fully Minds with agency living in virtual reality universes and femtoscale density computers. That's a black hole-like dimension that gets sucked out of space yes. and time. So he basically says that all the other advanced civilizations did that already and disappeared into inner space rather than to outer space gotcha. and exist outside of space and time. Now, maybe that's heaven, bro. Maybe that's where we're going. Yeah. But at least that explanation is less woo and more like something I can imagine based on pre-existing techno trends. Less know? woo than what? 
than to just say that we're like a spiritual thing and we're one with everything. Like this is something where I can like, imagine the steps that get us. How there. are we not one with everything? Well, if we're not there, you know, the pan psychics say there is no consciousness, there is no reality, but at least from a subjective perspective, if there is no consciousness, which is housed in a brain, which is housed in a body, there is no nothing. If there is no awareness, there is no anything. Oh wait, I mean right now, are we one with everything? I think we're differentiated, but still connected simultaneously. You know that term, a sinka sinka beta tattva. No, you ever heard that no, term? No, teach me. That's that means simultaneous oneness and difference. So that's mm. a term used to describe the Godhead, which is or the what was the name you called the thing inside a black hole? Transcension hypothesis. The transcension hypothesis, simultaneous yeah. oneness and difference, which is that you would have uh, on the outside, I guess, you would see this thing, or you yeah. wouldn't see the fucking thing because mm. it would be a big fucking black nothing. Mm -hmm. So you would there would be a witness of a void, and so on one level you would see whatever was within that all energetic forms, assuming there isn't like that spiral of shit that gets sprayed out of it. Sure. What's that called? The uh, um, you know, they say around a black hole, the energy gets dispersed. Okay. I can't remember what it's called. Mm. And God forgive me, all you great scientists and quantum physicists out there. But what I'm saying is, if the idea is that within yeah. these black holes, yeah. there is some kind of super compacted, extraterrestrial, yeah. whatever you want to call yeah. it, billions and infinite billions of simulations, yeah. then we're kind of witnessing, I guess, little uh, scales in yeah. the, on, the, in, on, on God's body or something, which sure. is so right. So death, to get back to death, and the only reason I keep going back to it with you is because I can see that for you, there's some anxiety surrounding the concept of annihilation that every single being on this planet up until this point has gone through. I mean, we're literally like, we're, it's we're just, I find it so horrific. It, the, the horror is directly proportionate to how much I adore the nuances of subjectivity. So for example, when I watch movies, right, I think cinema is, is a transcendent technology. You know, when you watch a movie, so many things are happening, right? You're not just looking at the screen, you're looking into the screen. You're not just looking at the characters, you're looking yeah. into the characters. Our unique capacity for mirroring other minds, to conceive of other yeah. minds, that we do that when we communicate with one another, right? We yeah. talk and then we make inferences and I make a model of your consciousness and my consciousness in yeah. order to relate to what I think is you, right? Yes. Um, but the amazing thing is that happens when we watch movies too. So they can like create these theaters, these stories, they can pattern these journeys of transformation, these fantastical yes. voyages for these characters. And I can sit in the theater and I can experience what's known as the didactic di shift. The didactic shift is the moment where I actually assume the viewpoint of the character. Yeah. So I, my soul, maybe my consciousness leaves the theater goes into the screen, goes into that character's yes. mi m mind, and is now looking out from that character's eyes. Yes. And when you lose yourself in a movie, that's what's happening. That, to me, is... I don't know, quantum fucking mumbo fuck. The point is space and time have fallen out of deep space. Like I yes. am, I have transcended myself and I'm experiencing that character's journey. However, if the projector breaks, yes. if the sound quality in the speakers busts, yes. if the electricity goes away, if the machinery that runs that techno miracle shuts down, yes. there is no movie and I don't have the transporting experience. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with consciousness. Yeah. Consciousness has the capacity to transcend space and time. We do it when we're in flow, when we have divine experiences, when we listen to music that makes us cry. Like, that's, yes. that's ineffable. That's Godhead. But if somebody gets a fucking aneurysm or, or, or a fucking disease, you know, then the shit doesn't happen anymore. Well, no. So that's my, that's my issue with mortality. Well, we can, the machinery matters. I got you. But let's yeah. agree on one thing, though. We have to agree on this one thing. Okay. I've given you the impression that I have some like deep belief that there is some sentient part of myself that will continue after the annihilation of my physical body. Could be a delusion, maybe not. But for me, it's a could be, maybe not. In other words, it's a big, fat question, question mark. And it must be the same for you as well. It is. I just, I'm so... I find myself so sensitive and open to the emotional highs and lows of great art. I'm so affected by not just the art, but also awestruck by our capacity to encode the transcendent in machinery yes. that, is, that gives us the capacity to 
house ineffability in a container. Hit play on that song again. Yeah. Record this conversation yeah. so that it's not fleeting and ephemeral anymore. Yeah. And so control is a big part of it. The mm. divine and letting go and connecting to the infinite, but I want to put a container around it. Okay. I want to record it. You're doing it too with this podcast. Sure. My whole reason for being is to battle ephemerality, is to actually grab the goddamn poetry of the ineffable and put a goddamn container about it. And, and, and maybe that's like... I'm the little guy fighting a cosmos that is much bigger than me and that's screaming ephemerality. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Beauty is worth housing. Beauty is worth putting a container around. And so that's my like You want to make battle. beauty zoos. Yes. Wanna you want to take yes. fucking beauty yes. and put it in a, in a yes. enclosure for us to yes. look at. And we yes. love your beauty. We love the enclosures that you've built. The problem is we're dealing with pure impermanence, you know. And what I'm what I'm getting at is just that the thing that I have... Um, that I like to play around with. And I've, I've learned this. I've learned this from uh, Roshi Joan Halifax. You know okay. who that is? No. Ooh, she's amazing. She um, she was actually married to Stanislav Grof. Mm. And mm. she... Um, she uh, LSD psychotherapy. Yes, and she works with dying people. She's worked with dying mm. people. And so that's one of her... So sad. I, well, it's one of her... Um, one of the first things that they teach you when you're working with a dying person is that if you can even though you may feel sad, to go and sit with a dying person with this idea of like, God, this is so sad, is f in a way for this dying person, you're adding to the, th to the weight of what's happening by putting that possibility of that course. this is sad. So it's like a training. You have to train to do this. You know, Of course it's sad because we're attached to this form that this, the container, that this, that this thing is like swirling around in. So anyway, uh, she talks a lot about Zen and the concept of radical insecurity being the fundamental human condition, which is that sense of, I don't know what's going to happen or the pre cat scan result state where you're like, what's going to happen? And we don't know. The reality is we don't know. We can't know this fucking black hole, this concept of what is the beautiful thing you said about transcension, not just transcension. No, you're talking about exponential. We're time blind or something. What did oh, you yeah. Do? We're blind to exponential change. We're yes. Future blind. It, we're future blind. And that produces within us, if we become aware of it, yeah. I think probably what Ernest Becker is talking about, a sense of just pure and our ponds are rippled by mm -hmm. this. Our ponds mm -hmm. are like it's creating waves in the ocean of yeah. ourself because yeah. we know that no matter what we whatever. What was the thing that you're, you're so smart? What was the thing the guy said? We have to create personality because it's a uh, necessary illusion. Yes. Yeah. The necessary illusion of personality is, in fact, a delusion itself. OK. And that delusion, yeah. that delusion, yeah. that fundamental delusion yeah. is keeping us from experiencing fully yeah. the reality of the human condition, which is to be completely insecure and completely unaware of what's to come. And what if. Like McLuhan said, what if the medium is the message? What if putting the container is not just a container over the thing, but the container makes the thing? In other words, when you watch a movie, the story only works because of what you're shown, but also what you're not shown. It's what's edited in and also what's edited out. Sure. The container that makes Jason Silva is necessary for the pattern of information and articulation and, yeah. and interpretation of reality that is filtered through the container right. of me and the container of my brain. And so maybe my obsession with containers comes from an intuition or a realization that even putting language to things is imposing order on chaos. Jo Jordan Peterson says the artist contends with the unknown and makes it known. He has a foot in the unknown and he makes it known through the act of articulation. Sure. Terrence McKenna said you take the mushrooms of language and what do you experience? Ecstatic articulation, empowered vocalization. Through language, we create a container, but we also create the thing itself because without that container, it's 
infinity, which is chaos, which is formless, which is nothing. But this is fascinating because you are a conduit for the infinite. You're the bridge. And yet this thing that you're bringing here into the world, you're, you seem to be resistant to. And it's beautiful, man. I'm telling beautiful you. Beautiful battle. <laughs> it, yeah, no, no, no. That's exactly right. It's it's what we're talking about, the collision of these two things. Yeah. I mean, this is what's so beautiful is well, that maybe we create reality through language. Like maybe, maybe we are all reality authoring engines. I mean, we certainly are in terms of our own subjectivity, but maybe most of the time we let it happen passively or unconsciously. Yeah. And taking a conscious, making a conscious effort at authoring your reality, stage designing your reality, being the choreographer sure. of your reality, sure. knowing that you have the capacity to then suspend disbelief, right? Because you know it when you go to a theater, it's like an example of that. It's like, okay, I know the stage is fake. I know they've dressed that up. I know yeah. those actors are in costumes. As soon as the shit starts, I not only suspend disbelief, but as Janet Murray says, you actively metabolize belief. Wow. So when you're a reality author, when you're trying to steward the contents of your consciousness, you're doing that. You're like, okay, what are the words that I'm going to use that are not just going to describe, but are going to generate reality? Yeah. What is the set and setting that I'm going to create for my life, not just when I take psychedelics? Sure. Who are the people that I'm going to hang out with that I'm going to become a sum of the people that I hang out yes. with? McKenna said you become what you behold. So you take an active control, an active stewardship of your creative and linguistic choices to author your own reality, not because... You want to, but because you have to, right? You either create reality or it will be created for you, and it might not be to your liking if so. So it's like, I don't have a choice, you know? And I don't think anybody who puts a microphone up and speaks loudly is doing anything less than bringing, Create, re, reality. bringing reality into being with the power of language. Absolutely. I think McKenna yeah. did it. I think Jordan Peterson is doing it with an enormous mic. And you can tell when he's contending with the unknown and trying to put it into language and yeah. getting teared, teary-eyed as teary-eyed. he does it. You can feel the agony of yeah. trying to impose coherence yeah. on an ineffable universe. But you, I think we're all doing the same thing. One of the things McKenna talked about, which I love, and I think that you, you're, you're, you're articulating it, is uh, this concept of uh, ex- ecstasy, right? Yeah. So the concept of ecstasy, and people hear the term ecstasy, and they think, oh, that must only relate to the positive state. So ecstatic love, ecstatic yeah. joy, ecstatic comfort, ecstatic sex. But McKenna was saying, no, there's ecstatic terror, there's ecstatic horror, and, and there's ecstatic, and, and so, so I guess... The, I have an example of ecstatic horror for you. Give it to me. The trailer to this new movie called Hereditary. I don't know if you ever played trailers on this podcast, but maybe... What is, what is it? Just, to, it just it's, The trailer is clearly a, a taste of ecstatic terror terror it's uh, the reason that you would even go see a horror movie yeah it's yeah like, yeah why would you do that well exactly. there's a kind of thrill at like a safe container in which you can see the darkness that's right and that is what i think the universe is doing through us mm. the universe is creating a safe container to experience the pretty much one of the most horrifying things you could do to yourself as a universe would be to create a complete limitation and an obvious annihilatory moment in this thing where you're going to lose everything and everyone and if you really look into that horror the thing that right now you're like no this is terrible this is this is awful but if you spend a moment or i have really looking into it and i have conce- you know really thought long and hard about can tell. just let's make sure this isn't some you're not just being like you're not like let's make sure you're not being a death cuck Let's make sure you're not someone who's just pretending this thing is good, even though there's no way around it. No, let's actually look into it and see. And what I have noticed is that if I really am lucky enough, and I mean this, to experience a momentary fear of death, if I'm lucky enough to get my pond rippled by the terror of death, and I have that moment in my laboratory of self to analyze that experience fully, then what I have found in there is a sweetness, a beauty, a joy, something that is so profoundly lovely that we begin to realize that we're not really trying to escape death. We're trying to escape the inescapable bliss that is inside of everything and is so overwhelming that it makes us want to like retreat into fear. Mm. That's what I think. Because whether we're you and I are, are like fireworks shot into the sky by some random cannon having this conversation as we fade into nothingness or whether we're technologically advancing fireworks that are like wait hold on a second let's turn ourselves into stars and then once we turn ourselves into infinite stars let's 
Com- let's turn ourselves into fucking black holes, man, and create a billion universes inside of it. Either way, if you ask me, it's so beautiful that we want to turn away from the beauty because it's too much to bear. The beauty crushes us. It's heartbreaking, mm. man. Mm. It's heartbreaking. You know, your mom's going to die. Your mom's going to die. You're going to have to bury your parents. This heartbreak, if you look into that, it's so sweet. It's yeah. so sweet. I, 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 I am not won over by that because I actually find it, uh, even the thought experiment, you know, in which people who do psilocybin and experience their own death symbolically and say that it's so sweet and so beautiful. Like, but listen to that. They said it was so sweet and so beautiful because they didn't actually die. They experienced something that they think is like what death is, but obviously they didn't die because their brain function never went limp. So they were always there. Awareness persisted and they watched maybe the shutting down of the ego structure mm-hmm. and then experienced what happens when you're not separated from the world yeah. in a safe environment. And I'm sure that is that from the objectively that can be aesthetically profound, but they didn't die. I'm not they, talking they, about that. I'm not talking about okay. post death. Yeah. I'm talking about the experience of the contemplation yeah. of the impermanence of yeah. love. Yeah. And that if we really look at that, so you think it's beautiful? Well, it's, that's, it's like the end of La La Land. Did you like La La Land? I didn't see it yet. Yeah, you should watch it. It's a beautiful film. And, and, and my favorite part of that film was the very end sequence, there's a dream ballet. Dream ballet that basically replays the entire story of the film, the two-hour film, yeah. into a four-minute sequence oh, where wow. all the key moments in the film are happen again yeah. in this dream ballet, except that the characters all make a slightly different decision. What oh, could cool. have been, what might have been, sure. what should have been. So it's full of that wistful longing and realization mm. of like, if only this could have been like this. And yeah, it's the most beautiful thing ever. It's beautiful because it's so pungent with sadness, yeah. because we see ourselves in that, and because it's like we're all holding hands in crying together yes you know what i mean and so there's some beauty but the beauty i think comes from the cathartic release of how sad it is but not because it's not sad not because it's not tragic well sadness and tragedy are beautiful that's what i'm saying i'm saying if we are to accept the universe if we're going to mainline the universe man and we're going to look up into that motherfucker and see these are black holes now maybe they're alien civilizations but they could just as easily be things that are just sucking in matter infinitely into a big fucking nothing and if we look at that yeah. and think, oh, my God, I, I look at the, the, the cosmic dust that seems to be forming some kind of like, it seems anthropomorphic, some of those things. And you're like, what the fuck is that? That's beautiful. But then we look at the black holes and we're like, no, that fucking sucks. Yeah. I say no. I say we accept the entire universe, which means embracing and falling in love with death itself, accepting that if this thing we're in is so yeah. beautiful, then the I, annihilatory moment must also be beautiful. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, 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 it's malfunctioning. An, it, it, it's a nice thought. It's a nice thought. Yet, you know, if we would have listened to gravity, we wouldn't have made the Hubble Space Telescope. We wouldn't have put it into orbit. We wouldn't have like been able to look at the cosmos. Like, like it, it, our agency and our imagination. It's like we're. McKenna calls this a, an extruder of technological material. Like, yeah, I love the, it when he's, I the, love the, that. Cor, the coral reef like yes! animal that takes in matter of low organization and then through the filters of the mind extrudes space shuttles. Yes. And so why can't we do that with our, with our own biology? Oh, I think we should try. Okay, I'm not good. saying don't go for okay, it, good. but I'm just saying in the meantime. Sure. In let's, the meantime. Let's not practice misery. In the meantime, because we have this inevitable not inevitable but for now we must deal with the fact that should death have like like if we could go back and get rid of death then i guess like this planet assuming like maybe i guess maybe would have developed interstellar travel but if we didn't we'd be standing on a lot of fucking dudes right now oh, like we there'd just be fair a enough. big trembling mass of sentient flesh on the planet vibrating into space kill us please this sucks i'm yeah. fucking a highway I, we'd be driving bodies on bodies we'd just be like walking across like would be feel pretty yeah. good probably a lot of yeah. fucking cocks and pussies yeah. in there but still it's maybe yeah. preferable to have dirt instead I hear you. I just, I just, you know, there, you hear so many people just encouraging us to just live the mystery. Um, and I suppose for every mystery you solve, there's another mystery that opens. So rather than just live the mystery, I'm like, no, no, no. 
be constantly in battle against the mystery, learning or demystifying, solving mysteries. And then if new mysteries open, let that be the inspiration to solve the next one. Absolutely. Like, like it's just, you know, it's Dylan Thomas. It's do not go quietly into that good night. It's no. rage against rage. the of life. Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, no. Do you know about... The closest thing to that was Siddhartha's sort of... Re- well, that's Buddhism. It? Okay. So in the Bhagavad Gita, what we yeah. have here, and you, would lo- you will love this, Jason, yeah. because it goes along with what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. So um, in the Bhagavad Gita, what we have here is a situation of Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna, the symbol for the universe. Arjuna, the warrior, has pulled the chariot in between these two opposing armies and is looking out, and, and, he, and he says to Krishna, he says... I don't see enemies here. I see fathers and teachers, and I don't want to kill them. And he drops his bow, Gandava, mm-hmm. and he says, I will not fight. That's the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. It's called Arjuna's dejection, mm. saying, I'm not going to fucking do this shit. Mm-hmm. And the entire Bhagavad Gita is Krishna telling Arjuna, here's why you fucking fight. Here's why you do it. Here's why you do the battle. Jason, the battle is beautiful because it's mm. who you are. It's mm. what you are. You're here to fight this fucking thing, man. Yeah. Fight death for us. Conquer death for us if you can. Yeah. I'm just saying the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that as we conquer our enemy, yeah. we can simultaneously love it. Sure. And when you realize those two things can join together, sure. Sure. it's going to make a more fun battle. Yeah, well, of course. And it also you also realize that in fighting that enemy, you figured out who you were. Yeah, so the, the, so the, the enemy, enemy becomes your teacher mm-hmm. and your lover mm-hmm. and weirdly your mother and father. Death is your mother too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you see, we finally landed in a place where we're not disagreeing. I like that. Ah, but we can disagree. That's what's beautiful. No, That's of course, the beautiful matter course. and antimatter. It's so fun because yes. it's like it dances it's, together. Yeah, and it's beautiful, man. Mm. And I, I'm so grateful to you for uh, spending time with me here and letting us go into this place. Yeah, man. It's I'm a, grateful. I'm grateful to you, dude. It's funny how something as ancient as the art of human conversation has become now one of the fastest growing, like media forms i know isn't that interesting like it's beautiful like the podcast like what is the podcast it's just interesting people talking yeah interesting people talking you know try to pitch that to a tv network I have this show it's just like interesting people talking yeah i don't think what's so, the plot man. but you know yeah and, and you know what else it is i think it's like nodes of the universe trying to work out some problems we're yeah. like can we fucking smooth this shit out is there a way yeah. you and i are both struggling with a thing in different ways and 100%. it's like let's fucking what do you got man what do i got what do we have and 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 then of course Back to the container, the tools to record this, the tools to make this not ephemeral, means yes. that not just those that might listen live, but that somebody tomorrow or the next day or next month wakes up in the morning, looks up at the clouds, is feeling melancholic or sad or curious or restless. They put on these headphones yes. and guess what? They're inside two people's minds. Yes. They're inside two people's minds. Well, I've got bad news for you. I didn't record this. Oh, shit. I just... <laughs> Well, oh well. Great to see you anyway. Jason, thank you so much. How can thank people you. find you? Um, well, they can always follow my YouTube channel, Shots of Awe, A-W-E, as well as uh, my Facebook page is at Jason L. Silva uh, or Instagram at Jason L. Silva. Can Thanks, we get your bro. home address? Caraca, calle paso real, Quinta Maya in Venezuela, my childhood home. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Jason. This has been a delight. Much thanks to Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of the DTFH. Much thanks to those of you who have subscribed over at Patreon.com forward slash DTFH. And of course, thank you, Jason Silva, for coming on this episode. The links for Jason's upcoming tour will be in the comments section of this episode over at Duncan Trussell, 